ask one question as the new year comes in. Raise your hand if you made some New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions? Yeah, we have a few of us that still do that. And then we got a lot of us that are like, no, I ain't even. Not even trying. And it's funny thing about New Year's resolutions is that the problem with them is as soon as you mess up or fall off the bandwagon, you're like, ah, oh, man, forget it. I'll wait till next year. You give up and go a whole nother year instead of just saying, ah, maybe I'll start back tomorrow. It's like it's the easiest thing to give up on because we associate it with just the New Year's. But I, I, I was at the pool this year because I decided in my mind I am going to start swimming. Yes, black people can swim. And so I said to myself, self, you can do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit to going to swim at least two to three times a week. And so I said, what I, the problem I always have, though, with swimming is you really have to co coordinate to kind of do this. And I was always turning when I was supposed to be breathing and breathing when I was supposed to be turning. So I was choking most of the time when I was in there. I look like a black baby seal that hasn't learned how to swim yet. So it was really not pretty, but I found that if I use a snorkel, I can go in the pool and I could swim without having to know all that technical stuff. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy a snorkel. So I got one of those full face snorkels, you know, the kind that covers your entire face and it has the big thing coming out of it. And yeah, I got one of those. I got, because I was determined that this year is going to be the year that I am going to do this. So I started to put this on, and I got, I'm going to the National Public Y, and all these little kids are running around, and I'm reaching into my bag to pull out my mask, and I put it on, and I turn around, and all the kids just look at me like. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, what in the world? I must look so ridiculous right now. And in that time, I really thought about, you know, I'm just going to take the mask off and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to not do this because this is too embarrassing. You know, I don't want to be embarrassing my family. If my kids hear about this, all it takes is one camera and my whole legacy is out the window. Because I know once it gets back to my kids, I'll never hear the end of it. And so I was think, debating, should I do this? And I was like, I saw the people in the pool swimming. And they look so effortless, and they're swimming, and they're swimming. I was like, this is the piece that's going to allow me to be a swimmer. So I said, no, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to press forward. I don't care that I look weird. I don't care that I look crazy. I'm going to do this. Let me ask you this. How many of us in our spiritual lives feel like this sometimes? I know that there are many times when I've had an opportunity to witness to somebody and what came to my mind is I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't know if this is the right place. I don't know if this is the right environment. And because of that, I allow myself to be tricked out of an opportunity to spread the gospel to somebody else. But what I realized through this situation is this, if you really, really, really want something bad enough, that you really, really want to do something, you won't allow anybody to keep you from doing what you need to do. So that being said, I jumped in that water. And I said all along that if I could just be able to breathe, I can do just like they do. And so I started swimming, and I was going. I was swimming. I looked like Michael Phelps. I believe if he was in the pool at the same time, that I might have had a chance. And so I'm swimming, and I go down, and I'm getting ready to touch the wall. I'm like, do I do something fancy like those flip kicks and then push off? But I was like, no, I don't, no, no. I, don't, I saw the lifeguard, he was like 15 years old, about a buck 10. And it's like, if I go down, he's going to have to do some special military type stuff to get me out of here because 
No, nah, it just won't work. So I just touch the wall and I start coming back and I'm halfway down the other side and then something starts to happen. And I'm like, wait a minute, what's wrong with me? Why, why, why can't I, I should be able to do this easy. And I realize that swimming is not as easy as it looks. I got about halfway to the other side and I started catching a cramp underneath my arm. And all of a sudden, I'm not doing those, I'm not looking so pretty anymore. Now I'm just trying to, just trying to stay alive. And I'm like, maybe two hands will do it. And I'm kicking and splashing, and water's going all over the place. And the kids are looking at me again like, and I'm realizing that sometimes in our lives, we put in our heads that to be successful, to do something, to do, I can look at somebody else and I see what they do and I think all I need is one more thing and I can do just like them. But what I'm here to tell us is that it's not always so easy. You know, to be successful at something, we have to learn that it requires hard work. But too many times in our life, we don't want to put in the hard work. We just want to get a snorkel and jump in the water and think we can do it. But no, God is challenging us in this new year to recognize that we can be successful, but it's going to take what? Hard work. So so I realized in that moment that maybe Michael Phelps and I aren't really on the same plane But that doesn't mean that I am going to give up on my attempt to become better. Because what I realize is that this is not about me losing weight or anything like that. This is about me becoming more healthy for myself. See, I could be doing this for some, in some cases because I say, you know what, I want to look better for my wife. Now, yeah, that might be a benefit for it, but what happens if I do this but my wife says, after all this work, that she doesn't see a difference. Right? Because sometimes we place such a high premium on what other people think about us, what other people might think about what we are doing, how we look, all this stuff, and as a result, our our expectations are that they are going to approve of us. But when they don't approve of us, it sets us back. Sometimes it even causes us to give up altogether. But what God is showing us is that we can't do things just because what other people may think. It's about us in our own personal life, in our own personal walk with him. So God was showing me that this year is going to be the year of personal best. Say personal best. Amen. And so one thing that I did begin to realize as I started this swimming expedition is that whenever I want to do something that is positive, whenever I want to do something that is going to benefit myself or somebody else, any time I realize that I'm not just fighting against the water, I'm not just fighting against technique, I am fighting against a law. And that law is this. In Romans 7, chapter, in the 21st verse, it says, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is there with me. So I find that in the Bible, it even tells us any time we are going to try to do something right. Every time we are going to do something, even in our natural life, that is good. Evil is there with us trying to prevent us from being successful from whatever it is we are endeavoring to do. And that is the law of how evil works. But it is up to each and every one of us to be determined to not allow the devil to keep us from meeting our expectations and our goals. Every one of us has to make the decision for ourselves as to what we're going to do and how we are going to do this. Because so many times the evil evil comes in and the devil comes and he puts something in our ear, in our mind, and he kind of gets us to give up on our goals, to give up on our expectation. He wants to see you quit. 
I don't care if the, the expectation is I want to read more, if it's I want to pray more, I want to be a better person, whatever it is, the enemy is going to try to keep you from being successful. And remember when I was young, my brother John was a tremendous runner. He was like an all-world runner. And I used to watch him run all the time, and he was so fast. He had all kind of trophies. He had all kind of awards. He had all kind of accolades. He was always in the newspaper. And I'm nine years younger than him. So as I was growing up, I looked at him and I said, one day I want to run like him. So what I used to do is I used to challenge kids in school. In elementary, I was challenging everybody. We would be like, after school, me and you, we racing outside in the in, in the, uh, um, in the in the, on the street. We're going to go from this telephone pole to that telephone pole. We didn't have a track, so we just had to make up our own race courses. So I was like, we're going to race. I would race older kids, younger kids, girls, moms, whoever was there, I was racing them. Some moms can run, y'all. They didn't get that name soccer mom for nothing. But I was just, I would race anybody because I wanted so badly to become a good racer. I wanted to be like my brother was. So I had started, even at a young age, practicing what it is I wanted to do. I had made it in my mind that I will not fall short of that goal and that expectation. So what happened is one time the track coach asked me to come on, on, the, on the course and run with them because they needed somebody. And I was like, this is the moment. This is what I've been waiting for. Now, I was about four years younger than all these other kids, and they wanted us to do a 400 yard, which is one time around the track. And yes, it is the worst race in all of track. So I got out there and I said, I'm going to do this. And I just started running. And I took off like a crazy man. I put everything I had into that first 100 yards. And I was beating everybody. For everybody, I was beating everybody. I don't know if you know anything about track. But in track, there's something called the wall. Now, I thought the wall was just a myth. But I tell you, when I got around that 50-yard marker, I hit that wall so hard, I almost passed out. I was so tired at that 50-yard mark, I was like, I can't make it anymore. But I didn't want to be embarrassed because all these people were watching me and they would see me winning. My, the coach was looking at me like, wow, this guy's going to be a star. So what did I do? I was like, I got to find a way out of this. So I happened to see some of my younger friends behind the fence. And so I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I started running real fast. And then I ran off the track over to the fence and started talking to my friends. I was like, hey, how you guys doing? Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. And everybody's like, what in the world? But I had my exit strategy. And I decided in my mind that this was too hard for me to do. And I gave myself a way out. And what I'm here to tell us today is that I don't care what you're trying to accomplish. You cannot give up on your goals and your expectations. You have to be determined that I am going to fight through, I am going to press through, I am going to make my way through until I meet that mark. Because once again, we know what the enemy wants to do to you. He wants to make you quit on your goals. But we can do it and we will do it if we fight. If we make up in our mind that this is going to be the year that I am going to do my personal best. And so God is challenging us to examine ourselves and make some goals, make some expectations, and set in our minds what we need to do in order to reach those goals. Now, the great thing about best, uh, our personal best is that our personal best is not dependent on anybody else. See, when I'm running track, my personal best has nothing to do with the person in the lane to the left or the right of me. I might not even win the race, but I could still do my own personal best. You know that some people, their burst, I've seen people that run long cross country, and their personal best is not to come in first place, 
Their personal best is just to make it to the end. And for some of us today, our personal best may not be the most elegant evangelist there ever was. It may not be to be a preacher. It may not be to be an evangelist. It may not to be any of these things. Some of your personal best is just going to be, God, I just want to be there in the end and hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all I ever want. For some of you, your, your expectations are greater because God has called you to something even greater. But even if you are a preacher, even now, that's not good enough. There is always something more that you can do. There is always something more that God is challenging you to do. So for every single one of us, there was always more. I don't care if you're a young child all the way to the oldest person in the building. There is still more for you to do even now. And your personal best changes over time. When you were younger, your personal best might have been, okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do the next thing and the other thing for that other person. When you get older, your personal best is, I'm going to get out of bed this morning. I might have breakfast, and I'm going to make my way to church. And I'm going to sit in my seat, and I'm going to wave my hands. 20 years ago, you'd be all around this church running and shouting. But when you get older, you realize that things change. Personal bests change for each and every one of us. Let me ask you, how many here... Let me see, can I get the 65 and older crowd to stand up? Anybody 65 and older? If you can't stand up, some of you are like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand up. (laughs) See those people here? They have run the course and stayed in the race to make it to this point now that they are over 65 years old and still in the house of the Lord. Still in the house of the Lord praising God, thanking God, giving him the honor. But the thing is, their race is not over yet. There is still more that they can do. There are still personal bests that even they can do now. So let me ask you this. Let me see my married couples. Anybody that's married, stand up. Anybody that's married, even if your couple is not there. Look at all of these married people here today. Now, some of you have been married for a long, long periods of time. I know my wife, we're at what, 29 years now? It'll be 30 this year. Amen. Okay, who's got that sister? I know, who's got that beat? Brother Archer, what do you got? 40. 40, ooh, okay. Anybody got 40? Anybody 40? 40, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, 45, Sold over here. Brother Stafford, what do you guys got? You're also 40. Amen, amen, amen. Now, to get to any, any amount of years in marriage, it requires work. Right? Can you just give up and say, I made 40, that means I'm all good. I don't have to do anything else. Right, when you know when in a marriage it requires hard, it's not easy. Some of us make it look easy, but when you go home with these people and you start, why y'all laughing? You start to realize that marriage is a lot of work. Husbands, as husbands, can you just sit back and say, all right, 20 years ago, I got her a really good birthday present or anniversary present, so I don't need to worry about it anymore. I'll just get her a card, and that's good enough. Is that good? You think that'll work? Some of the hardest decisions in my adult life is trying to figure out what I'm going to get my wife for her anniversary next year. Every year it gets harder and harder because when the longer you stay together, you done gave her everything under the sun. But that doesn't keep me from saying next year, I'm going to try to do even better. Every year you got to try to top that. And as wives, do you get to say, ah, when I was younger, I did things for my husband. But you know what? 
He's an adult. He can take care of himself now. No. No, you don't get to do that. At least I hope you don't. And you realize in marriage that especially men, we're, even, we're, we're like Benjamin Button. We go backwards. The older we get, the more we need you to do stuff for us. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. She said, I had to add the just joking at the end because they'll take away my man card. But the point is that even as married couples, if you've been together 10, 30, 40, 50, 60 years like Bishop, you have to continue to put in hard work and do your personal best every single year so that you can make it to the next year. Because sometimes it takes a little bit extra just to make it through. When you go through hard times, it's your work that you put in together that allows you to survive. You could sit down. You could sit down. Thank you, my married couples. But my point is that our personal best don't just stop because you did a good job. Our personal best are something that we have to continue to do for the rest of our lives. Let me see all my, my younger people, anybody from the age of um, 30 and under. Stand up, 30 and under. 30 and under. Let me see what we got. Well, let me see what we're working with. Let me see what we're working with. 30 and under. Okay. <laughs> so 30 and under, right? Some of you have had some success. Some of you guys have finished school. Some of you guys have graduated. Some of you got a master's degree. Some of you guys are on your way to getting a doctor's degree. Some of you, you're just hoping that you can just finish high school. But my, what I'm showing you today is that each and every one of you has to set some goals for your life. Each and every one of you has to have some expectations for your life. Some of you have reached some of these ideas that you had in your life and said, one day I want to do this. Have you set some goals in your life that you've achieved? Raise your hand. Okay. Does that mean you get to stop now? Do you get to stay in your mom's basement now for the rest of your life? Because I guarantee you they're not going to let you stay. Even your mom's grace has limits. Her personal best is you got one more year and then you're out of my house. <laughs> Every one of you has to set some goals and boundaries for what you want in your life. And I'm not just talking about our natural life, but I'm especially talking about your spiritual life. You see, because sometimes we get so busy as young people. Yes, I said we. We get so young, busy as young people trying to chase our dreams, that we forget that we are supposed to be children of God. And as children of God, we need to set expectations and put the things of God first in our life. Set some personal best for your spiritual lives now so that you can get a firm foundation to build the rest of your life on. You three just stepped in. I think you're under 30, right? All right, stand on up with the rest of them. I'm talking to y'all. <laughs> Every one of you has to make up in your mind that I want to be a child of God. See, when you're younger, you can fall under your parents and your parents can cover you. But then you get older and now it is all about you. What are you going to do? Yeah, your parents are going to be there to help you and try to support you as best they can. But now the decision is yours. Are you going to be a child of God? And um, are you going to be more than just a, a, a child of God, but someone that God looks at and said, that is my son, that is my daughter in whom I am well pleased? Have you made a commitment to chase after him, to read your word, to pray, to have a relationship with him? Because I guarantee you, if you make those goals in your personal life, and you meet those goals in your spiritual life, it will make your personal goals in your regular life easier to obtain. Because with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. So make some spiritual, personal best goals that you want to reach and continue to challenge yourself 
every single day and push the boundaries, even push your own expectations so that you can be more than you even thought you could ever be in your spiritual life. Young people, you could, be, you could see. Amen. So our personal best, what do we have to do to achieve that? How do we obtain that? Well, we know that in the Bible, it talks about, um, it talks about some of the principles that we have to adhere to. The first one I want to talk about is in Philippians, the third chapter and the 12th verse through the 14th. And I just want to read this one to let us know that this is something that we have to continue to strive towards. It says, not that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize of, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's not about what I did in the past that's going to matter. It's about what I'm going to do next. What are you going to do next? We have to always continually to be pressing, 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 pressing our way towards our next mark. We can never be satisfied with what we have done, what we have accomplished. We cannot become stagnant as men and women of God. And the reason, one of the main reasons why is because the devil never gets stagnant. The the devil never gets tired of trying to break us down. The devil never gets tired of trying to destroy you. It so says he goes about seeking back and forth, seeking whom he may devour. That is what the word of God says. He is actively, constantly trying to disrupt your life. So if you get stagnant and stay still, you become what an easy target for the enemy. We have to always be working, always be pushing ourselves, always be learning what is next in my life for Christ. Paul understood that, and that's why he said we have to keep pressing. We have to keep pressing. We have to keep pressing. And we have to recognize that if maybe you don't know him and you need to know him, or maybe you are doing some things and you realize that you have to make a change in order to be where God wants us to be. Well, the scripture also talks about that. And it says in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter and 17th verse, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creature has come. The old has gone. The new is here to stay. The new is here to say. So we have to realize that if you are in Christ, who's in Christ here with me today? We got a lot of people that are in Christ. And the beautiful thing about being in Christ is it doesn't matter how horrible or how bad you were in your past. You are now a new creature. Don't you thank God for that? Praise God for that. Because some of us know that if people really knew what we really were in our old, before Christ got a hold of us, they would look at us a lot different. But the thing that I'm so glad is that God knew every single thing about me, everything that I did, every dark, dirty secret that I may have done, he knew that and still said, you are my son, you are my daughter, and I love you more than life. Thank God for a God that forgives and loves. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, he is an awesome God. So we do have to recognize that we are not that same creature that we once were. And so then we go forward to understand that the next thing is that if we want to go beyond, we have to put in the hard work. We have to train ourselves. So in 2 Timothy 3rd chapter 6 through the 17th verse it says, all scripture is good for, as God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 
Say training in righteousness. And that training in righteousness comes from the word of God. And it says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if we want to be equipped to be able to do the job that we are going to have to do as we move forward in our life, we need to know the word of God. We have to get into the word of God. Pastor Marsha was expounding on that earlier today about the word of God. And we saw that that inspirational video about the word of God and talking about how it's a fire and how it consumes everything and how we have to use the word of God to break every chain in our life. Many of us are still bound and and chained to our past or our, our, our habits of old. But this is our opportunity. This is the year where we can finally break all of those chains and be free to be what God has called us to be. Do you want to break your chains this year? Do you want to be free this year? Okay, then we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. The other one, which is another scripture that Sister Alana said about prayer, is that Philipp, uh, Philippians 4, chapter 6 through 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, say every situation, by prayer and by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Have you been presenting your request to God? Have you let him know what you need? I mean, have you really, really gone in and said, God, this is what I need. I need you to be that child that makes your parents so annoyed that he says, you know what, I'm just going to give it to them so they'll stop bothering me. You need to get in God's face all the time, every day, and say, God, I need you to help me through. I need you to help me make it out of this situation. So it says, with prayer, we need to present your request to God. And the peace of God, which uh, uh, transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. He will guard your hearts and your mind. Many of us are struggling, and we keep coming back to this, the battle for the mind. The battle for the mind. I was talking to some somebody earlier this week and they were talking about some of the young people and some of the things that they were going through. And I remember reading articles and talking to some young people about the struggles that they were going through in their mind and how they couldn't find peace. And some of them were doing things to harm themselves because they couldn't find the release and they didn't know how to to manage the stress and the disappointment and the heartache. So some were cutting themselves and some were drinking themselves to the point where they were blacking out. And some were just sleeping with everybody just so that they could feel something. And God is just reminding us that if we don't have Christ, if we don't have a hope, I just can't imagine how people can live in this world without Christ. Because if you don't have Christ to to hope on and to believe in and to trust, to know that he will see you through your storms and your trials and your disappointments and your heartaches, if you don't have Christ in your life, what are you going to use to get by? You can only go to so many groups and you can only go to so many people to have help. But the problem is when you go to people in the world, they're in the same problems you are. And they can't help you. But there is a God. A God that loves you. A God that can see your situation. A God that will look into your circumstance and pluck out the right solution for your problem. A God that could see your child struggling and say, Mom, don't worry, I got it. Mom, don't worry, I'll be there with them in the night. I'll be there with them in the streets when they're out there doing things that you know you've been praying against all this time. Don't worry, Mom, I got them. I was talking to, I was listening to Brother Manny talk and he was talking about, he was out at this facility and all these people were coming into the facility 
And these women were out in 10 degree weather in mini, mini, mini skirts and all these mini dresses or these tank tops and all these things. And he's like, they, he's like, don't they have coats? And they're like, no. Nah. He's like, no, nah, they don't put on no coats. And they said, they got to look good. And it's like, look good? How do you look good when you're freezing like this? But the thing is, they do what they have to do because people are out there desperately searching for something. Something to make them feel wanted. Something to make them feel loved. Something to make them feel desired. Something to make them feel that they have value. Something to make them feel that they are connected with a community. But in the house of, the God, of God, we have all of that right here. Right here in the house of God. Yes, we are blessed. You are so blessed and you don't realize what you have. You don't realize what you have out there in the house of God. And the last one that I have that I want to talk about is community. Hebrews, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, in the 24th verse through the 25th, it says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We have to be there to have each other's back. I don't know about you, but when I used to run track and I was getting tired, the one thing that used to spur me on is down the home stretch, you would have the crowd all around and they would start cheering you on and they'd start yelling your name and they'd start getting up and jumping. Sometimes they would have a sign and all of a sudden when you felt you had nothing left to give, you would hear all those people cheering you on and you'd find one more gear and the next thing you know you start pushing your way through until you make it to the finish line. That is what we are for one another. When you see your brother and your sister down and they feel as, look as though they might be going down for the count, that's where we come in. And that's where we cheer them on and we say, don't worry, you can make it. Don't worry, I know you're going through a difficult situation, but God will see you through. That's where family comes in. That's where brothers and sisters in Christ have your back and will encourage you and will strengthen you and help you find that one more gear that is going to help you to make it through your situation. And yes, it is very important that we do this because we need each other. We have to have each other's back. And so as we come into the house of God, we have to come not just for ourselves, not just to see what I could do for me, but we have to come in to be our personal best, even as brothers and sisters in Christ. When we come through those doors, we should be looking around and say, God, who can I minister to do to today? Who can I just go and say hello to? Who haven't I said hello to? Who haven't I said God loves you to? There's a, we saw there's got to be about eight, nine people here that are here for the first time. Are you going to go up to them and say, welcome, welcome to the church? Are you going to go up to them and say, hi, my name is? Are you going to show them the love of God so that they won't just say, ah, it was a nice place to go, but I didn't feel anything? We need to show them that this is a place full of love and consideration and family that really goes beyond just using our words but in actions and our deeds. Because somebody here today needs to hear from you. And that small kind word could be exactly what they came here for today. You could be a difference maker in their life today. But again, it requires us to go outside of our norm, to do our personal best, for some of you, that is your personal best. Some of you have what, what, what we now know as social anxiety, where oh, I'm too shy, I can't do that. 
I see a lot of people shaking their heads. Yep, that's me. But you know what? Through Christ, all things are possible if we just believe. And we don't let ourselves off. Don't let yourself off easy. Don't just say, ah, I can't do that because mm, that's just the problem I have. Don't you know that that very act of you going outside of your comfort zone and being there for somebody else could be the thing that you needed to break that chain in your life? That one time that you go out and you shake somebody's hand and just be a child of God to them could be the thing that you need more than they do. God can use that to set you free. So I'm challenging each and every one of us this year to look at our lives, to look at what we've done in the past and say, that was good. I'm proud of what I did. I used to have so many trophies in my house from track from when I got older. And you know what? At one point, I just stopped doing track because I didn't have the love in it. And I look back at all those trophies that at one point in my life meant so much to me. I mean, I had a room full of trophies. But now I look back on those trophies. I don't even know where those trophies are. They're probably in the trash somewhere. And it just shows you that those things that we did behind us, those things that are not anything important in the kingdom, those are only temporary. It's only what you do for Christ will last. Amen. Amen. Let us all please stand. So I am challenging us this year. I am challenging each and every one of us to examine ourselves and push ourselves towards our personal best. To be more, to do more in Christ. And if we do it together, there's nothing that we can't be able to do. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your word, Lord God. Challenging each and every one of us, Lord God, to go beyond our norm, Lord God, and to continue to press towards our personal best, Lord God. Our personal best each and every day, Lord God. Lord, and I pray that you will challenge us, show us, reveal to us, Lord God, what it is that you desire from us, Lord. Lord, we want to be all that we can be in you, Lord God. We want to make you proud of us, Lord Jesus. So today, Lord, we are putting ourselves before you and saying, Lord, have your way in our lives. Make us the man and the woman and the child of God that you desire me to be. Lord, this is our day, this is our year of personal best, Lord God. So we are excited to see how you are going to use us in this new year, Lord, of 2024. Lord, so we put ourselves at the mercy of your feet, at the mercy of your throne, Lord God, and say, Lord, add the increase as we chase after you. Today, Lord, we pray also for those that may not know you. Today, there may be people here that have not come to know you, and you have put it on their heart to just come today and turn their lives over to you. Or maybe they knew you and have gone astray. Well, today is the day, Lord, you have troubled their heart. You have placed them here today for this time such as this. So, Lord, trouble their heart. Challenge them that they will turn their hearts over to you. Thank you, Jesus, in your name.